Hey guys, so we're back and right now we are going to be reading The Ethics of Living, Jim Crow, an autobiographical sketch by um, Richard Wright. So here is the one who was yelling, go toodles. Say hi. Want to say hi? No? You don't want to say hi? Okay, you need to go to bed, okay? Pasito. I love you. but right now he doesn't want it to be with me so my husband will take care of him okay so the ethics of living under Jim Crow as I mentioned in the previous video um, the Jim Crow laws were enacted and they spread all through the south okay um, let me see so these are the lessons that he gets from these Jim Crow laws and I'm only going to pick a couple of them um, because this right this reading is so heavy and it's so difficult to read I'm sure you all um, knew that and you all saw that so if we look at 2543 my first lesson in how to live as a Negro came when I was quite small we were living in Arkansas. Our house stood behind the railroad tracks. Okay, so right off the bat right now, we know that he lives on the wrong side of the tracks. That's where you get that from, okay? So he fights these little these little, these little boys, right? They get in a fight. This little boy throws something at him. He's bleeding. Of course, this child, we have this image of a child going home. He's got blood pouring out of his face. You know, he and his, um, he and his, friends get into this big fight of course the Caucasian kids come at them and this poor little boy has just like blood running down okay and if we look at 2544 his mom has a very odd reaction which we'll talk about right now okay um when night fell my mother came from the white folks kitchen I raced down the street to meet her I could just feel in my bones that she would understand she would tell me exactly what to do next time I grabbed her by the hand and babbled out the whole story she examined my wound and slapped me how come you didn't hide she asked how come you're always fighting okay that was out I was outraged and bald and bald right so he's crying bald I'm sorry bald he's crying um this isn't usually a reaction that a lot of mothers would have okay my kid comes in after a fight I'm like well you dumbass why did you get in a fight and then you know we fix it it wouldn't be like hey how come you didn't leave um between sobs I told you that I didn't have any trees or hedges to hide behind that wasn't a thing I could have used as a trench and you couldn't throw very far when you were hiding behind the brick pillars of a house she grabbed a barrel stave dragged me home stripped me naked and beat me till I had a fever of 102 she would smack my rim with the stave and while the skin was still smarting impart to me gems of Jim Crow wisdom I was never to throw cinders anymore I was never to fight any more wars I was never never under any conditions to fight white folks again and they were absolutely right in clouding me with the broken milk bottle didn't I know she was working hard every day in the hot kitchens of the white folks to make money to take care of me when was I ever going to learn to be a good boy? She couldn't be bothered by my fights. She finished by telling me that I ought to be thankful to God as long as I lived that they didn't kill me. Wow, so that's a, that's a lot to uh, that's a lot to digest, right? I mean, that is just that's wow. That's just something that was very difficult for me to read. Okay, um, so a couple of things that I want you all to know about this about here. Um, they were I was. When he says um, they were lucky, that he should be thankful that um, they didn't kill him. I want you to look up a name. I want you to look up the name of Emmett Till. Okay, Emmett, like the Dallas Cowboy football player, and Till, T-I-L-L. -L. I want you to look at that and see what happened to Emmett Till. Okay, and think about what, he, what happened to him. Think about how much he suffered, and then put it in this context. Okay? Something that I want you to think about. Maybe that's something that you want to um, discuss as well. Okay? All right? So mom has absolutely no pity for him. Don't do it, right? Okay, so let's see. Let's, let's see. That's the first law, right? The first law is the don't fight. Don't fight white kids. Okay? You should be grateful that you're not dead. All right? So don't fight them. Okay, so the second one. Let's go to the next page, 2545. Okay, 
When I finished grammar school, I had to go to work. My mother could no longer feed and clothe me on her cooking job. Okay, this was um, unfortunately the reality for a lot of African Americans. He couldn't even finish school, had to go directly to work. And this kid, he's, he's quite little. If he finishes, he was quite little when he's going to work. Okay, so the next paragraph. The morning I applied, I stood straight and neat before the boss, answering all his questions with sharp yes sirs and no sirs. I was very careful to pronounce my sirs distinctively and distinctly in order that he might know that I was polite, that I knew where I was, and that I knew he was a white man. I wanted that job badly. Okay. He looked me over as though he was examining a prize poodle. Let's stop right there. Okay, um, I usually give this huge lecture on slavery when I'm teaching a British or early American literature. We don't get it with here because, I mean, right? This is after 1865, okay? Um, but when when he writes, he looked at he looked me over as though he were examining a prize poodle. Um, when the slaves were brought onto shore. This is how they were examined. They were examined the way you would examine a steer. Okay, was a steer healthy? Were they unhealthy? Did they look strong? Um, when the slaves were brought onto shore, of course, a lot of them had boils, they had been beaten, okay, they had welts. They would be rubbed with lemon juice and I believe it was gunpowder so they could look shiny and darker, so they would be much more attractive to the buyers. Okay, so this here, this is nothing new, and it should upset us, it should piss us off, it should just, our our rage should be boiling by reading that, okay? That is, that is um, treating African Americans as if they weren't human, okay? That's dehumanizing them, that's othering, okay? And we've gone over in class, right, why it's so dangerous to other. Okay, um, I was actually watching, and I think Anthony, I think I wrote this down in your um, reader response, that um, I was watching this, hang on, let me see if I can find it. Um, I was watching this uh, YouTube channel called um, Spooky Rice, and he just went over a Japanese film. Okay, I don't think I'm going to be able to see it right now because it's age restricted. Oh yeah, totally. I'm not going to see it. It's age restricted. But um, I'll um, put in, in the announcement the name of it. But it was a Japanese film about the Japanese um, crimes against the Chinese during the Second World War. Something that we really don't talk about. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> um, but it was it took place in Unit 731. Okay, and the film says it again and again. This is how they dehumanize the Chinese. This is what they do to the Chinese, so that when they are, so that when the Japanese kill the Chinese, they don't feel bad about it because they're not human. Okay, we see that here. Okay, he's not human. He is a prized poodle that is to be shown. And if you've ever seen the dog shows, right? What do they do with the dogs? They grab their their legs. They pull them apart. They look down. They look at their nails. Okay, that is infuriating. But he has to do that. Okay, this is what he has to do. He has to go through these loops just to get um, the job. Okay, if you look at 2545, doesn't work out well. I worked hard trying to please. For the first month, I got along okay. Both Pease and Maury seemed to like me. I was not learning anything, and nobody was volunteering to help me, though. Thinking they had all forgotten that I was to learn something about the mechanic of grinding lenses, I asked Maury one day to, to tell me about the work. He grew red. What are you trying to do, Negro? Get smart? No, I'm not trying to get smart. Well, don't, if you know what's good for you. I was puzzled. Maybe he doesn't want to help me, I thought. I went to Pease. Say, are you crazy, you black bastard? Pease asked me, his gray eyes growing hard. I spoke out, reminding him that the boss had said I was to be given a chance to learn something. Negro, you think you're white, don't you? No, sir. Well, you're acting mighty like it. But Mr. Pease, the boss said, he shook his fist in my face. This is a white man's work around here, and you better watch yourself. From then on, they changed toward me. They said, good morning, no more. When I was a bit slow in performing some duty, I was called a lazy black son of a bitch. Okay, how fast did that change? Okay, all he wanted to do was learn something about the job, sort of be an apprentice about it, right? 
And um, there's he has this, this horrible, of course, um, scene with Pease and Maury. Okay, he doesn't know how to answer it, but he ends up getting beaten up and losing the job. And if we look at the bottom of that section of page 2547, when I told the folks at home what happened, they called me a fool. They told me that I must never attempt to exceed my boundaries. When you're working for white folks, they said, you've got to stay in your place if you want to keep working. Okay, that is the reaction he gets. So keep in mind, we've seen the reaction that his mom gives when he's beaten up, and now the reaction that he gets when he's beaten up at work. Okay, it's like, hey, no, you have to stay in your place. You can't get uppity. Okay, and that's a word that you all need to remember. Uppity. Okay, uppity. Um... That word makes reference to African Americans who want to somehow better themselves, but they become outspoken. Does that make any sense to you? Well, okay, and it's I don't use that word. It's it's very offensive, but that's what they would say. They say they would say things like you're being uppity, you're acting uppity. Um, but think about those two reactions that they had, especially this one. Okay, you have to stay in your place. Okay, these reactions are not, as I said, reactions that you would think someone would receive after this abuse. Okay, but let's let's keep going. Okay, it gets it gets it gets worse. Let's see. So we've done the work. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. The next one. You all. The beginning of part two. Everyone. Oh my dudes. This one. My Jim Crow education continued on to my next job, which was portering in a clothing store. One morning, while polishing brass out front, the boss and his 20-year-old son got out of their car and half-dragged, half-kicked a Negro woman into the store. A policeman standing on the corner looked on, twirling his nightstick. I watched out of the corner of my eye, never slackening the strokes of my chamois upon the brass. After a few minutes, I heard shrill screams coming from the rear of the store. Later, the woman stumbled out, bleeding, crying, holding her stomach. When she reached the end of the block, the policeman grabbed her and accused her of being drunk. Silently, I watched him throw her into a patrol wagon. This is a horrific scene. It's very uncomfortable to read. It's even more uncomfortable to read more um, uncomfortable to read aloud. This is the scene of a horrific rape, right? This girl was just thrown in by um by a man and his son. She was just raped inside of the store, and when she comes out, she doesn't receive help from the police officer. On the contrary, she's thrown into the the wagon because she's drunk. Well, she's you know she's injured. She's been horribly hurt. Okay, he goes into the store, and this is what the owner tells him. Boy, that's what we do to Negroes when they don't pay their bills, he said laughing. His son looked at me and grinned. Here, have a cigarette. Not knowing what to do, I took it. He lit his and held the match for me. It was, this was a kind, this was a gesture of kindness, indicating that even if they had beaten up the poor old woman, they would not beat me up if I knew enough to keep my mouth shut. Yes, sir, I said and asked no questions. After they had gone, I sat on the edge of a packing box and stared at the floor, at the bloody floor, until the cigarette went out. Okay, this, this is not normal. Okay, this is definitely um, not normal. But in this world where a race of people have been dehumanized, when they are others, when they are less than human, when they're called vermin, um, this is what happens. Okay, this is normal to them. Okay, and this is something that I tell my students when they said, oh, why do we have to read these really long, boring works? Um, it's happened already. No, because this can happen again. Okay, th this can. And when we get to the Holocaust um, readings, I'm going to show you all the propaganda um, posters that the Nazis held out for the Jews. And you guys are going to see that this propaganda, you'll see how, how it works. And I want you all to to look into your own lives and realize, hey, you know, that's something not right there. Maybe I should say something because this is still happening right now. All right. Um, that day at noon, while eating in a hamburger joint, I told my fellow Negro porters what had happened. No one seemed surprised. One fellow, after swallowing a huge bite, turned to me and said, huh, is that all they did to her? Well, yeah, wasn't well, that enough? Shucks, man, she's a lucky bitch, he said, burying his deep his lips deep into a juicy burger hell it's a wonder they didn't lay her after they when they got through okay it's a wonder they didn't kill her once they got through right she they she should be grateful 
okay? Yeah, you got raped, you deserved it, but she should be grateful that she's still alive. Okay, this is a running theme. You should be grateful you're alive. You should be happy that you know, that they didn't kill you like Emmett Till. You should be... This, this is just really sad. No, we shouldn't just be grateful they're alive. We should be hopeful and we want them to have the same um, opportunities and the same um, rights that we do. Not just, you should be grateful. No, okay, right? This is something that needs to be crashed, but... Jim Crow laws, right? Let's see. Which one's next? Oh. Oh, yeah. The drinking in the cars, right? If you've ever read um, To Kill a Mockingbird, I'm assuming most of you all have read it or heard about it. About halfway through the book, the kid's um, nanny, servant, whatever you want to call her, Calpurnia, starts calling the little boy Mr. Jim. It's Mr. Jim, yes sir, Mr. Jim, no sir. This is a kid she's raised since the age of maybe four or five. Alright. And that part reminded me of the part that happens to him when he's in the car with um with the uh white um with the white men. Okay. Because okay. he doesn't remember he doesn't say yes sir, he doesn't say no sir, right? Okay. Right, so he doesn't say no, sir, and if we look at 2548, Negro, ain't you learned no better sense than that? Ain't you learned that you say sir to a white man yet? Okay, so right there, right, they throw him off, they want to beat him, they beat him up, and at the bottom, he says, Negro, you should be glad that it was us you talked to that way. You're a lucky bastard, because if you would have said that to someone else, you might be a dead Negro now. So that's another that's another rule, right? Got, gotta write all these rules down because I'm kind of losing track on them. Okay, so let's say wrong side of the tracks. Uh, don't fight with the children. Um, don't try to learn anything at work. Don't worry about the rapes. Oh yeah, you gotta say no sir, yes sir to every Caucasian you see, even the little children, even the young ones. Okay, all right. So see, I'm keeping track of them. Okay, see, keeping track of all the laws. And I think I skip a couple of them. Okay, so I'm really sorry that I skipped them. All right. So we have that, let's look at part four. This would be law number five. Negroes who have lived in the South know the dread of being caught alone upon the streets in white neighborhoods after the sun had set. In such a simple situation as this, the plight of the Negro in America is graphically sim symbolized. While white strangers may be in these, white, these neighborhoods trying to get home, they can pass unmolested. But the color, the color of a negro skin makes him easily recognizable, makes him suspect, and converts him into a defenseless target. Late one Saturday night, I made some deliveries in a white neighborhood. I was pedaling my bicycle back to the store as fast as I could when a police car swerving toward me jammed me into the curbing. Get down and put up your hands, the policeman ordered. I did. They climbed out of the car, guns drawn, faces set, and advanced slowly. Keep still, they ordered. I kept my hands up. They searched my pockets and packages. They seemed dissatisfied when they could find nothing incriminating. Finally, one of them said, Boy, tell your boss not to send you to in white neighborhoods after sun is down. As usual, I said. Yes, sir. Right, so you can't go into certain neighborhoods after dark or the police will come after you. Okay, here we also have this... No, the, the abuse by the police okay we saw that with the rape victim that she was thrown into the drunk tank and this one well they just wanted to do something to him and they were sad when they weren't able to all right let's see um this one number six and the one in part five this one was this one was weird and i want i'm going to explain something to you all right here so he's a hall boy in a hotel right here my Jim Crow education broadened and deepened. All right, so they were bit when they were busy. Um, he had to go help, you know, help deliver liquor and cigarettes to, to um rooms. Right. These women were nude most of the time. They did not bother about clothing, even for bellboys. When you went into their rooms, you were supposed to take their nakedness for granted, as though it it startled you no more than a blue vase or a red rug. Your presence awoke in them no sense of shame, for you were not regarded as human. 
If they were alone, you could steal a sidelong glimpse, glimpse at them. But if they were receiving men, not a flicker of our eyelids could show. Okay. Your presence awoke in them no sense of shame, for you were not regarded as human. Okay, so this is another time that we're seeing, right, this othering, okay, this lack of respect, right? Um, right, there's this level of respect that, that we have um, towards others. Okay, we don't, we feel ashamed to, you know, run around naked in front of people, okay? Um, like, um, just... It's just it's just the level of respect that you have with your fellow um, human being, right? I mean, I would never expect uh, myself to be naked in front of just random strangers. I mean, that's shameful for me, and I don't want you know I don't want that weird um, reaction there. But they didn't care. The African American person in the room wasn't human, so what did they care? Okay, and this is, as I said, I wanted to talk a little bit more about this because this isn't something that we think about when othering. Usually when othering, we think of the violence against the person himself, the person himself or herself, right? The person themselves, the violence against them, okay? Oh, they're not human, they can be raped, okay? Oh, they're not human, they could be beaten up, okay? But right here, this is psychological, okay? This is like the person doesn't exist anymore, okay? I'm going to ignore the person in the room. Okay. And I've told your class before, okay, that we often think that, okay, the opposite of love is hate. The opposite of love is not hate. Okay, if you hate somebody, you still have feelings for them. The opposite of love is indifference. It's like you don't care about that person. Okay, and this is what he's facing, right? This is what Richard is facing here. He cares, it's indifference. Okay, that's, that's the worst. That's what you've forgotten. Right, let's go to, no, I want to do that one, I want to do that one. Okay, there's loads of these, y'all, but we can be here all day of this. All right, 2551. We're almost, we're almost done, y'all, almost done. 20, 2551, this one is uber important, so I want you all to listen up, right? He got a job in Memphis, right? The optical company. <laughs> let's see how this works this time. Okay, he wants to have an education. And unfortunately, even in the library, the Jim Crow laws were enacted. I personally cannot imagine walking into a library and having to have someone's permission to check out a book. I would lose my mind, okay? I can't imagine going into a bookstore and having my husband's permission or my boss's permission to have a book. I would lose my mind, okay? But this was something that was normal to them. Okay, when he goes to the library, 2551, when I went to the library, I would stand at the desk, hat in hand, looking as unbookish as possible. Okay, so he has to hide his intelligence. When I received the books desired, I would take them home. If the books listed in the note happened to be out, I would sneak into the lobby and forge a new one. I never took any chances guessing what the white librarian about the fictitious white man would want to read. No doubt if any of the white patrons had suspected that some of the volumes they enjoyed had been in the house of a negro, they would not have tolerated it for an instant. instance. The factory force of the optical company in Memphis was much larger than that in Jackson and more urbanized. At least they liked to talk and they would engage the negro help in conversation whenever possible. Okay, you see that? The negro help. It's not my co-workers, it's not my colleague, it's the negro help. Okay, very separate. Everything was separate here. By this means, I found many, that many subjects were taboo from a white man's point of view. <clears throat> Among the topics they did not like to discuss with Negroes were the following. American white women, the Ku Klux Klan, France, and how the Negro soldiers fared while there. French women, Jack Johnson, the entire northern part of the United States, the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, U.S. Grant, General Sherman, Catholics, the Popes, the Jews, the Republican Party, slavery, social equality, communism, socialism, the 13th and 14th Amendments of the Constitution, or any topic calling for positive knowledge or manly assertion on the part of the Negro. The most accepted topics were sex and religion. All right. Why do you feel that they didn't want to discuss, especially France and how the Negro soldiers fared in France after World War I? Okay, the reason why is because they were treated fairly decently over there. And a lot of African American artists, writers, singers, writers, musicians, actors found a lot of fame in the continent. Okay, again, we don't see things 
that are great until it's too late. Um, but they don't want to bring that up. Why? Because if you let's let a group of people who have been oppressed, who are jaw trotted, if you say, hey, look at how nice it is in France. Hey, Abraham Lincoln did this. Hey, you know, U.S. Grant, you know, General Sherman burned down half of, you know, a third of the South. Um, hey, you know, they treat them better here. Then the Don Trotted will pick up ideas. They'll become what they would call uppity, get an education, and fight the system. This isn't what they want to do, okay? So what they want to talk about is sex and religion. And every job I have ever had, you can't talk about sex and religion, okay? But they would rather talk about sex in public, okay, than chatting about General Sherman and U.S. Grant. Okay, so think about that. Think about who controls the education, who tells you what you can and cannot read, what you can and cannot write, or what you can and cannot study. Let's wrap it up. All right, so let's look at the, the, the last one. 2552. How do Negroes feel about the way they have to live? I think this question can be answered in a single sentence. My, a friend of mine who ran an elevator once told me, Lord, man, if it weren't for them policies and them old lynch mobs, there would be nothing but uproar down here. If it wouldn't, if it be, if it wasn't for the Jim Crow laws and the lynch mobs, okay, the mobs of men and sometimes women who would go and lynch African Americans, there would be nothing but uproar here. Okay, so what do I, what were African Americans told? They were told that with that they had to be taken care of. That without the laws in place, it would be chaos, right? Everybody, there wouldn't be any equality. There wouldn't be, um, it would be chaos because you would have people wanting to, you know, you'd have more competition. I don't know. I don't know the excuses they gave, but think about that last line, that without lynch mobs and without Jim Crow would be chaos. Uh, that's that's shocking to me. I would never think that would be chaos. I think chaos is Jim Crow and um, and lynch mobs. But the sad part about this and the sad part about this part of American literature, American history, and sort of what goes on now is um, that, that the people who were oppressed, the African Americans, some of them believed that. They believed that, oh, without this, we wouldn't be okay. Okay, without this, these rules, there would be chaos. And how badly were they treated, how badly were they told, you know, you don't deserve an education, you don't deserve a good job, you don't deserve this, you don't deserve that, you don't deserve to be with us, you don't deserve to mix with us. How long were they told that? that they were believe it. Okay. Since children, right? If you tell a child, you're stupid, they're going to believe it. They're going to believe it. They're going to keep believing it to an adult, right? Okay, so I want you all to keep, to keep that in mind. Um, your discussions... The dates are on your calendar. The reader response dates are on your calendar, okay? Again, you guys have been doing so well, and I will see you next time when we discuss the... What are we discussing? Hang on, hang on. When we discuss the Harlem Renaissance. Okay, so I'll see you guys next time. Bye.